Well, welcome back, critical thinkers. Hopefully, you all completed exam three and are ready for our last set of topics before the final exam. Up to this point, we've borrowed a lot from philosophy, right? Deductive and inductive reasoning, and a great deal from sociology with our discussion of the media, um, gender in the media, social media. Um, then we did focus somewhat, a little bit on psychology um, and economics when we talked about language. Much of the our discussion on language comes from the world of psychology. But there are la uh, but some of our last uh, set of topics, cognitive dissonance, obedience, and conformity. These topics are really all about psychological processes, unconscious psychological processes that we may not be aware of that impact our ability to be critical thinkers, essentially impact our ability to you know think well. Um, and so these are going to be some of our last topics. Cognitive dissonance, which is a basic psychological process and how that can interfere with our ability to be rational and interfere with our ability to make good decisions. And then we'll talk about conformity and then we'll talk about obedience. Um, and sort of the broad overarching um, thing that I want you to understand about these three topics is that they're examples of many of the psychological processes that we are all prone to that can cause us to lose our ability to think rationally or at least interfere with our ability to think rationally. These are basic psychological processes, things that all people everywhere are prone to, at least that's what the research would suggest. We're all prone to cognitive dissonance processes, which we'll learn about today. We're all prone to conformity and we're all prone to obedience pressures. And um, because of the universality of these psychological tendencies, I think good critical thinkers should be aware of these psychological tendencies to be on guard against them. Because the research is also clear is that people who are aware of these psychological processes and are aware that these psychological uh, phenomenon can affect them are less likely to have these psychological processes affect them. And so I think it's a good idea to learn what they are. So, cog so make sure to have the, um, the uh, lecture titled Cognitive Dissonance open, those set of lecture notes, um, so we can go over it. All right, are we ready? All right, the first slide says fair-minded, right? Because a good critical thinker is just that. A good critical thinker, thinker is impartial and fair-minded. And a good critical thinker recognizes that their knee-jerk reactions to things, their knee-jerk automatic reactions to things may not be grounded in good critical thinking, that you could be wrong, right? And so the first thing I want to just cover today are, um, are concepts that are um, sort of sources of um, uh, sort of cognitive yuckiness, right? Sources um, of reasons why we get all defensive about ourselves. Um, and there's two broad categories, just sort of vocab words I want you to know. And these are ethnocentrism and egocentrism. So this is on our second slide. Now, ethnocentrism is the sort of unconscious tendency most people have to put their own culture's values as first, to assume that the way their culture does something is the best way to do it, and when other cultures do something a different way, the automatic assumption is that way is less than or wrong or not as good as. And um, I think, a, and there are some cultural practices that are in fact arguably better, like sanitation, hygiene, right? Modern culture has definitely has advancements over ancient cultures because we have modern hygiene. I'm not suggesting that you can't make an argument that what you, how your culture does something um, isn't better, but you have to make that argument based on good critical thinking. You can't simply assert that because my culture views something this way, it's better. So let me give you an example of this in modern Western culture at least a, a cultural difference between modern culture and some other cultures throughout the world. So in modern, in our modern Western culture, it's sort of considered, uh, you know, inappropriate for a woman to breastfeed in public, right? Modern uh, American Western culture, right? If a woman is going to breastfeed, she uh, should do so inside her house or she should at least wear a cover over her and her baby because I know I like to eat with a blanket over my head. That's something I totally enjoy doing. So why wouldn't a small baby 
right? Why wouldn't a small baby also like to eat with a blanket over his or her head? If you can tell I'm being sarcastic, it's because I totally am. Right. So in our modern Western culture, though, um, breastfeeding is actually um, uh, less common than it is in lots of the other parts of the world. Right. When a woman gives birth, um, although many women breastfeed in our culture, it's less common than it is in other places. Um, and part of this is there are just barriers to breastfeeding, cultural barriers where women do not feel comfortable breastfeeding in public. Um, and if they do go out in public and their child needs to breastfeed, um, then they need to cover up, which is often hot and uncomfortable, not only for themselves, but then for their baby. Or they feel social pressure to go find a room uh, far away from other people. So they have to get up and isolate themselves from other people um, just to feed their baby, right? Um, and uh, a lot of times people suggest that women just pump. Um, well, pumping is hard work. It's much it's much more difficult to pump milk than it is to um, than to feed babies uh, out of one's actual body the way um, we evolved to do. Um, and of course, formula isn't as healthy as breast milk. And so women are sort of in this very tough bind. The culture uh, says it's sort of not okay to uh, to breastfeed sort of freely in public. So they're sort of stuck with these tough choices. Stay home. Don't leave the house. Try to find some other room away from their companions. Um, oftentimes the suggestion is to have them find a bathroom because I know I like to eat in the bathroom. Gross, right? Or to find some woman's room if they happen to be available. But either way, it's a big giant hassle. We can't just breastfeed without judgment um, freely. And and there's arguments to be made why why a woman would choose to sort of follow societal conventions. We do live in the culture that we do, and other people do feel squeamish, and they have this sort of ick factor when they watch someone breastfeed. They look at it as like a private activity, um, um, something that should only be done in private. But this is eating, right? This child's eating. It's not like you're you're not you're not urinating, you're not defecating. There's no sexual element here because. Mammary glands are for feeding babies. Here's a newsflash. The fact that they're sexual objects is completely secondary. And in, all, in, in, in some cultures, uh, breasts are not even sexual objects at all, right? Um, and so, but again, there is this cultural standard. And if a woman chooses to, you know, give way to this cultural standard, it's because she's being sensitive. She's being sensitive to this sort of the squeamishness of the people around her. But recognize that whatever your choice is, if you're a woman who chooses to only breastfeed in private, if you're a woman who chooses to cover up when she breastfeeds, recognize, and, and you're doing that because you're concerned about the comfort level of other people, recognize that that cultural standard is just that. It's cultural. There are other cultures in the world where that is not actually a thing. Women breastfeed freely in public. Uh, they where their breasts are out, they don't have to cover their babies, and they just do it. And we're not talking about primitive cultures here either, right? Just south in Mexico, um, uh, I had a friend of mine who went down there and lived for a couple of years, and he was in the middle of a, a conversation with um, a, with a woman, and her her 18 month old toddler comes toddling up right in the middle of the conversation, and he she just started breastfeeding like it wasn't a thing because it wasn't a thing, right? In that particular culture, um, breastfeeding um, openly and and naturally is just commonplace and people aren't bugged by it. They're not bothered by it. There's no ick factor. It's not squeamish, right? And I'm not telling you what to believe, right? I'm not, I'm not suggesting that, um, that if you feel uncomfortable watching another, uh, watching a woman breastfeed, that that makes you a bad person. All I'm suggesting is breastfeeding freely in public is, is in fact, completely cultural normal, it, culturally normal in many places in the world. In fact, the United States is uniquely, when you compare it to other industrialized nations, uniquely squeamish about the, about, about the idea of public breastfeeding, right? Um, and in fact, the, uh, f female breasts are uniquely sexualized in, in U.S. culture when you compare them to other places. Right. So this idea of ethnocentrism is something a good critical thinker pushes back against. Right. And and a good critical thinker says, OK, I have this automatic knee jerk reaction based on my culture to not want to watch a woman breastfeed. This woman has a biological obligation to feed her child. 
Feeding the child out of her breasts is, in fact, the healthiest, most beneficial way to feed that child. So what's more important? A new mother's and her baby's ability to go out in public and not feel like a pariah and feed her baby? Or your ick factor? Hmm, which is more important? Hmm, I know what I think is more important. I leave that decision up to you. But if nothing else, push back against that assumption. And, and not just that belief. There are so many cultural beliefs that we have where we automatically assume that the way our culture does something is the right way and the way other cultures do it is the wrong way. If, does that make sense? And a good critical thinker questions these assumptions, questions these automatic assumptions that, um, that we have about our own, uh, own cultural background. Similarly, right, is egocentrism. And that is the same thing, but in regards to one's own point of view, right? Not necessarily your culture's point of view, but your personal point of view. So think about the beliefs that you grew up with based on your own personal religion or your own personal uh, political point of view that you were raised within. We, all, we often have this automatic tendency to assume that whatever our current beliefs are, are the correct ones. And so somebody comes along with a different point of view, we might automatically reject their point of view simply because it is different than our own without critically evaluating whether or not that other person's point of view may have more validity to it than our own, right? And so it's important to not only push back against our cultural beliefs, but push back against our own personal beliefs as well and test them using all the tools that we've learned so far. Make sense? I hope so. Moving on to slide three. Now, when people threaten our cultural beliefs or threaten our egos, we will often defend in a very automatic, knee-jerk way, we'll, we'll often automatically defend our own cultural practices and our own pre-existing belief systems um, without critically evaluating the evidence. We'll automatically just sort of knee-jerk uh, defend our point of view, so sort of avoid the uncomfortable reality that we might be wrong. Nobody likes to think that they're wrong. Discovering that you've made a mistake or discovering that you've had a faulty point of view is uncomfortable. Nobody likes to feel that way. And we'll, we'll sort of explore why that is as a part of our, our sort of last arc of discussions, right? People like to believe very much want to believe that the opinions that they have about the world are the accurate ones. We have this very strong need to understand, right, for, for good reasons, right? And so there are some sort of defense mechanisms we engage in in order to make ourselves feel better, um, in order to avoid the idea that we can be wrong. And so um, examples might be rationalizing or engaging in denial. These are some strategies that we're going to talk about later on today. Right. But all of this discussion, this discussion about, you know, people feel defensive. People um, want to believe that their own points of view are the right one. People want to believe that their own cultural ideas are the correct ones. When those beliefs get challenged about the world, this creates a yucky feeling, it creates a yucky feeling inside ourselves. And moving on to slide four, that yucky feeling is called cognitive dissonance. And, and being wrong, discovering you're wrong about the world is one of the many things that can cause this uncomfortable feeling that psychologists call cognitive dissonance. And where it comes from is the idea that people like our worlds to be consistent. We like our beliefs to match reality. So we like to, we like to verify that we're right. We want our beliefs to match our behaviors. We want our beliefs to match our friends' beliefs. We like the world to be a consistent place because then the world is predictable. And then when the world is not a consistent place, this is very threatening for us and creates this really uncomfortable feeling that is called cognitive dissonance. And of course, I have a little comic here which illustrates uh, from, the, uh, from the comic uh, Dilbert an example of cognitive dissonance processes at work. Why should I have why should I hire you as my consultant? Uh, the pointy haired boss says to Dogbert. I'll use my special processes of cognitive dissonance to improve employee morale. How does it work? said the pointy haired boss. When people are in an absurd situation, 
And it's actually what's called an inconsistent situation, right? When people are in a situation that's inconsistent, although Dogbert calls it absurd, but when people are in an inconsistent situation, a situation that doesn't make sense together, then they experience a cognitive dissonance. So when people are in this situation, their minds rationalize it by inventing a more comfortable illusion. And that's in fact one of the things people can do. Okay, says the pointy haired boss, go do it. Isn't it strange that you have this dead end job when you're twice as smart as your boss? The hours are long, the pay is mediocre, nobody respects your contributions, and yet you freely choose to work here. It's absurd! No, wait! There must be a reason! I must work here because I love the work. He loves data entry. Right. Da da da. I love this job. Next! So this is an example of one of the many different kinds of situations, inconsistent situations, that can lead to an uncomfortable feeling called cognitive dissonance that a person might then rationalize, they're rationalize what's going on in order to make themselves feel better, right? This man engaged in some impressive mental backflips in order to get rid of his cognitive dissonance. And so for the rest of today, we're simply going to explore the research that has been done classically on cognitive dissonance, just to demonstrate our understanding of it, to make sure we understand and understand one of these basic psychological phenomenon um, so we can be more aware of how it might affect us. Because if we're aware how it might affect us as critical thinkers, it's less likely to affect us. So let's demonstrate cognitive dissonance within ourselves, shall we? Slide five. Exercising at least three times per week is important for good health. What do you think? Agree? Disagree? Well, if you disagree, give it a one. And if you agree, give it a seven. If it's somewhere in the middle, if you're like, I don't know, mm, then give it somewhere in the middle. I know I would say seven. Totally agree. Right? Exercising three times a week is, in fact, important for good health. I, don't, I know very few people who would disagree with that. Next slide. It is important for all citizens to vote so that the government reflects the will of the people. This year, more than other years, I would say seven. Can I choose nine? Can I choose 12? For, certainly for me, this, especially this year, people should be voting, right? Seven, I agree. Drinking and driving is dangerous. Seven. If you don't choose seven, I don't want to drive behind you. Next slide. Flossing your teeth is good for dental hygiene. Absolutely. Seven. My dentist says that every time I go in there. Seven. Condoms can prevent STDs. Seven. If you don't believe this, you need to go back to health class. Back to health class. Take my human sexuality class. Back, back, back. Yes. Seven. Using a cell phone in a public space like a restaurant is rude. Eh, five, yeah, if you talk loud, a lot of times when people are on their cell phones, they don't pay attention, it does seem kind of rude if you're loud, certainly in a movie theater, right? So what do you think? Did you say mostly sixes and sevens? Did you? Be honest. Next slide. Well, okay, do you personally always work out several times a week? <gasps> Do you always vote in the elections, even the primaries? You should. Do you always call an Uber if you've, or a Lyft if you've had more than two drinks? Always. Do you always do it? Do you always floss every day? Do you use condoms for every single one of your sexual encounters? All of them. Do you let your vo vo phone go to voicemail if you're in some place in public, like the movie theater? Do you always do that? Always. So what have I demonstrated here? I've demonstrated cognitive dissonance. One of the things that can lead to that uncomfortable feeling that we call cognitive dissonance that then can result in impressive mental backflips that we call rationalizations, right? This convincing ourselves about different things, right? this sort of mental backflips we go through, one of the things that can lead to cognitive dissonance is just straight up hypocrisy. Because we want to believe that we are consistent. We want to believe that our beliefs, our attitudes, our values actually match up to our behavior. And most of the time we don't think about it. Most of the time we have these beliefs about the world and we're not confronted 
Here, you're a hypocrite. Most of the time, we're not confronted with the fact we don't always follow through with our beliefs. We're not confronted with this reality, and so we're able to sort of deny any cognitive dissonance. We don't have to feel it because we don't think about it. But then when someone points out to you, hey, I thought you said it was important to use condoms. And, and, and here you are not, not, not using condoms in this situation. You're kind of a hypocrite, aren't you? That kind of makes people upset when you point that out to them, right? That makes people upset. Now, why? Because it creates an uncomfortable feeling. It creates this really uncomfortable feeling that we cause call cognitive dissonance when our attitudes don't match up to our behavior. Uncomfortable yuckiness. It's a thought process. It's a thought that creates a, a negative feeling. So where does cognitive dissonance theory come from? Slide 12. Well, let me give you a little bit of history into the history of psychology. So back in the 30s through the 50s, uh, the dominant approach to psychology was actually something called behaviorism, right? Be and behaviorism was about rewards and punishments uh, the and was championed by uh, psychologists such as B.F. Skinner. And it was the idea that motivations didn't matter. People's beliefs, people's uh, cognitive processes, basically what was going on in people's minds didn't matter. People were the same as pigeons. People were the same as rats. People were the same as any other animal. Our thought processes, our feelings, our emotions, our, none of that mattered. The only thing that mattered was what's called our history of reinforcement and punishment. People are more likely to engage in behaviors that reward them and uh, end with good outcomes and are less likely to engage in behaviors that result in bad outcomes, right? So it was simple and it was logical. And certainly there's something to that, right? It's not as if behaviorism turned out to be totally wrong. Um, it's just behaviorism ignored things like motives. It ignored things like personal history. It ignored things like people's hopes and dreams and expectations. It simply said, nope, if I, if I make something bad happen after a person does a behavior, they're not going to do that again. And how many times has something bad happened to you after you doing something and you still engaged in the behavior again? Like, for example, I don't know about you, but I've had my heart broken. And I have still, and that was a pretty bad outcome, and I have still somehow found it in my heart to enter into new romantic relationships, right? Um, and so it's just not as simple as that. Um, and uh, many people, uh, and it's the same thing with reinforcement, right? Having good things happen, right? While it is true, if something feels good, I'm more likely to want to do it again, but there's no guarantee, right? Just because something feels good doesn't mean I'm going to be all, yay, I'm going to do that again for sure. Oh, absolutely, right? People are complicated. People's histories, people's motives, people's values, they matter. And if you're going to predict what someone is going to do, maybe you need to go beyond simple people as pigeons. If you punish something, make something bad happen to someone, they're not going to do the behavior again. And it was that anyone who's ever had children knows that often that just because you've punished the behavior once doesn't mean that behavior is going to go away. It might, in fact, happen again, right? It's just not as simple as that, right? And just because you reward a behavior once doesn't mean it, it, it's definitely going to happen again, right? People are more complicated was a pretty radical notion at the time. And behaviorism was the dominant approach. It was the dominant approach for all of the 30s, 40s, and 50s, people as pigeons, but in the 1950s, there was this um, there was this you know very brilliant man named Leon Festinger, and he was a social psychologist, and he had this really radical notion that people's thoughts, like going inside their mind, not just what happened to them, good things, bad things, but how what people believed, their attitudes, their fears, their hopes could be a much better predictor of their behavior than simply what is their history of being rewarded and punished, right? He, he And it was really a radical notion. And he wrote this book in 1956 called When Prophecy Fails. And it was all about a, a UFO cult um, uh, by, 
by a woman who he called Marion Keach. That wasn't her real name, but that was the name he used in the book to protect her identity. She was the leader of a cult, and um, it was actually a Scientology cult for those who are interested in sort of the history of Scientology or the history of religion. And um, she actually believed um, uh, that UFOs were talking to her. Moving on to slide um, to slide 14. Um, she, she, she was from Chicago and she was a housewife and she believed that she was getting messages from the planet Clarion, that aliens were, were sending her messages and she was engaged in this thing called automatic writing where she would sit down and close her eyes and she would write what she believed to be messages um, from these, this alien civilization. And to all, from, to all external um, you know, people who interviewed her, including Leon Festinger, she seemed very sincere, very sincere in her belief. And she actually had a following. She had a following of, um, of a non-trivial number of people who also believed in her, um, in her teachings, uh, you know, dozens of people who believed, um, in, in her teachings and believed that in fact, um, she was getting messages. And she got a message um, that the world was going to come to an end um, in December 21st um, in the in the mid 50s uh, in the mid 50s I believe 1954. Um, she be they, that the world was going to end on December 21st, but that she and her followers didn't need to worry, didn't need to be concerned because they were going to be rescued on December uh, uh, dis midnight the night before. They were going to be rescued on December 20th. And this was the belief. And they were incredibly sincere. Um, whether or not she believed it, Marion Keach, her followers absolutely did. They gave away their all their worldly possessions. They quit their jobs. They quit school. They left their spouses. Um, they, they gave it all away. They gave away all of their things in preparation for leaving the planet because they sincerely believed that um, they were going to go off, Right. Um, and this group was also very private. It took uh, Leon Festinger a long time to um, gain their trust to allow him to come into the group and interview them and, and get information. Um, they, they shunned publicity. They didn't, they didn't want other people to, to know about this great cataclysm. They wanted to avoid um, suffering uh, during the cataclysm. Um, they just wanted, and, but, and, but they thought they were going to be saved, right? Um, and so people only, uh, so, uh, only the truest true believers were allowed to come to Mrs. Keech, Keech's house, um, on that December 20th, right? Right. And there was a complex belief system about why, why this was going to happen. And it was all grounded, um, in Scientology. So what happened? Well, Certainly the world didn't end. Prophecy failed, which was uh, the name of the book, When Prophecy Fails. So what did happen? Well, at midnight on December 20, 21st, right, when no visitor came and it's supposedly five minutes late, um, someone points out that, it, that a clock in the other room says only 11.55, right? The group agrees, I guess it's not midnight yet. 12.10. Now all the clocks in the house agree that it's past midnight, no alien has come. No group has come. Everyone is just sort of shocked. They believe the world is going to end in seven hours. 4 a.m. Everyone has just been sitting in silence. Nobody says anything. <sighs> Mrs. Keach begins to cry, which suggests that this was a sincere belief that she had. At 4.45, Mrs. Marion Keach gets another message another automatic writing message from the planet Clarion that said there had been no there will be there would be no cataclysm the world was saved because that little group sitting all night long had spread so much light that God saved the world from destruction now the next day newspapers are called this group wants to get the word out that their little group, that their belief system saved the world. This was quite a reversal because they'd actually shunned publicity before and now they want to tell all the people all about what their group had done. And so put yourself in the mind of these individuals. Something is inconsistent here, right? They have given away all their worldly possessions. They can't take it back. They have left their spouses. 
probably can't take it back, quit school, quit their jobs, right? They have done this really radical thing. Now, moving on to slide 17. According to behaviorism, something incredibly bad has happened to these people, right? Something incredibly negative and bad has happened to these people. They should be upset. They should be feeling very punished for their behavior. They should be saying things to themselves like, well, I'll never do that again. You'll never catch me trusting a false prophet again. That's what behaviorism would have predicted, right? Behaviorism would have predicted a negative outcome followed me giving away all my stuff. I'm not going to do that again. But in fact, the opposite happened. Something different happened. When something bad happened to them, it made them like it more. When the prophecy failed and something bad happened to them, they believed in their beliefs more. And this became quite the puzzle for Leon Festinger. And so he developed his theory of cognitive dissonance. That when two elements of your world are inconsistent, this creates an uncomfortable feeling that people will engage in impressive me mental backflips to get rid of. And he suggested that people will often change their beliefs in order to have their world make sense. They'll change their beliefs in order to have a consistent worldview, right? And because these individuals weren't able to take back what they did behaviorally, right? They couldn't make their world make sense. They couldn't go back to their jobs. They couldn't go back to their spouses. They couldn't ungive away all their stuff. The only path to make their world consistent and make sense again was to convince themselves that all of the behaviors that they did running up to this point were good, right? It would be too hard and, and, and inconsistent to have all of that effort be wasted, right? And so they create a rationalization to get rid of their cognitive dissonance, right? They do in, engage in impressive mental backflips to try to make their world make sense again, right? Because now it does. No, me giving away all my stuff, me sitting here all night, that saved the world. <sighs> No more cognitive dissonance. And so the theory of cognitive dissonance, um, as outlined in, in the book called A Theory of Cognitive Dissonance, he wrote two books, one called When Prophecy Fails and the other A Theory of Cognitive Dissonance. Um, he, he, he put forth this really radical notion that knowledge mattered. A person's knowledge mattered. If you were going to predict what someone was going to do, you had to know about their thoughts. You had to know about their feelings. You had to know about, about what was going on in their head. You couldn't just look at their rewards and punishments, what had happened to them, to make predictions. You had to try to crawl up inside someone's psychology to make a good prediction, right? You had to know that these people's behavior, the giving away all of, of all of their stuff, was a, was a behavior motivated by a complex belief system. And just because their behavior of giving, all, giving away all of their stuff was punished, you couldn't dismantle these people's belief systems. And so even though their behavior was punished, gave away all your stuff for no darn good reason, people just concocted a good reason. Does that make sense? I hope so. Right? And so let's sort of unpack cognitive dissonance a little more, right? So, and this is one of the grand theories of social psychology, just so you know, is this idea that we have this desire, this unconscious universal, which means everybody has it. And in fact, the research is clear. This happens everywhere in the world, no matter which culture we go to to explore this. We have this unconscious desire for our world to be consistency, to be consistent within ourselves. We want our beliefs to match our behaviors. We want all of our different beliefs to match each other. We want our beliefs to match our values and that we very much dislike being, being made aware of any inconsistency. We don't like it. 
We don't like it when people point out that our beliefs are wrong. Reality has the nerve to contradict our belief systems. We don't like it when someone points out that our beliefs don't match our values, that we're hypocrites, right? That makes us feel uncomfortable, right? That is the theory of cognitive dissonance that has been very well supported by the research, right? Right? Now, it's important that cognitive dissonance doesn't say we are not inconsistent. It's not suggesting we aren't hypocrites. It's not suggesting that our beliefs can't be in, in violation of reality. It only says that when we become aware of our inconsistencies, when researchers nefariously make us aware of our inconsistencies, or when other people make us aware of our inconsistencies, then we become defensive, we start to rationalize, and this becomes a barrier to cognitive, uh, to, to good critical thinking. So this unpleasant feeling, this cognitive dissonance, which is an unpleasant state of arousal, and I don't mean like sexual arousal, I mean like just you're feeling keyed up, you're feeling sort of just psychologically eh, angsty, right? That we have, we're strongly motivated to get rid of this bad feeling as efficiently and as quickly as possible. And oftentimes, the most efficient, quick way to get rid of cognitive dissonance is to engage in mental backflips where we say, no, I don't care what reality has to say. My beliefs are still the right ones. Go away with your facts. Or to engage in rationalizations, right? Like those folks did in the, in the when prophecy fails example, right? And that is the idea behind cognitive dissonance and has been well supported by a, a, a host of psychological research. So let's move on to our next slide and, try, and, and use another working example of how cognitive dissonance sort of works. So now we are on slide 20. All right, so here is an, ex uh, an example of thoughts that are not inconsistent and so do not lead to cognitive dissonance, right? So I can think about, you know, the riding the bus is cheaper than driving, right? I can think about that idea. And let's say as I'm riding the bus, um, I'm thinking to myself, hmm, I would like to get an iPhone for Christmas, a new one, the fancy one, iPhone 7 billion, you know, thousand, because that's what they're on now, right? Uh, these two thoughts do not create cognitive dissonance because they're irrelevant to one another, right? Right. I can think about both of these things in the span of a few seconds and I'm not feeling un unpleasant. I don't feel unpleasant arousal. I don't feel uncomfortable. No dissonance. Slide 21. There can be thoughts that are totally relevant to one another that don't lead to cognitive dissonance. Like riding the bus is cheaper than driving and, and also riding the bus is, saves on gas. I guess I should ride the bus today, I think to myself. No cognitive dissonance. These thoughts are totally consistent with one another, right? Right. Slide 22. Uh, there can be causally related ideas that do not cause cognitive dissonance. Riding the bus is cheaper than driving, and hey, look, I'm totally on the bus today. I have a, I get it, I, that is a win for me. No cognitive dissonance here, right? No yucky feeling. Everything is fine. Ah. Slide 23. Riding the bus is cheaper than driving. I told myself that I, I you know, I was going to ride the bus because I can't afford the gas and I can't afford the insurance and I need to, I need to really start using public transportation. It's just so much cheaper. And yet I get my keys. And I get in the car. And I drive to work anyway. Now, now, if someone points out to me as I'm getting out of my car and walking to my office, hey, weren't you going to start riding the bus? Didn't you say it was cheaper than driving? Oh, don't point that out to me. Don't look at me. Oh, now I have cognitive dissonance. Mean. Oh, no. Now I have this unpleasant feeling because these thoughts are dissonant. That's so what dissonance means. It means inconsistent. They're dissonant. They don't make sense together, right? And so that's the idea. And so when we have inconsistent parts of ourselves, when our thoughts are inconsistent, when our behavior doesn't match our values, when our belief systems don't match the facts of the universe, this creates an unpleasant feeling that then we, are, we work to get rid of. 
And there are lots of things that can cause cognitive dissonance, right? Um, there are two really obvious ones, the ones that we sort that uh, that we sort of went over already. Sort of hypocrisy, right? Hypocrisy is a big one. When your values don't don't match your belief systems, this can lead to um, cognitive dissonance. Um, and then also uh, when uh, sort of when um, your expectations are violated about the world, right? Sort of when the world is inconsistent with your beliefs, that can lead to cognitive dissonance. Sort of hypocrisy and sort of um, a worldview violation, right? Your worldview is uh, upended. Um, but there are other less obvious forms of cognitive dissonance that have a long history of demonstrating how deep these processes can be, how unconscious and how unaware um, of these processes we can really be. Because most people are aware that we don't like feeling like hypocrites. And most people are aware that when we find out that we're wrong, that makes us feel yucky. That's cognitive dissonance. But there are three other types of cognitive dissonance I want to go over and I want to sort of share with you the research that has examined them that are more subtle. And so are easier to recognize when they're happening to us, right? Hypocrisy, having finding out we're wrong, those are big ones. Those are two big ones, right? And so, and and if you and let's say, on let's say hypothetically speaking, on some future upcoming exam, you had to describe cognitive dissonance, an example of cognitive dissonance, describing a time when you'd been a hypocrite. And how you engaged in mental backflips to get rid of uh, your the, the awareness you were a hypocrite would be totally legit. Or a time when you found out you were wrong, right? When you when you found out that your personal belief systems were wrong, and how you engaged in mental backflips to guard against that reality. Those would be perfectly acceptable things to write about. But I also want you to be aware of these more subtle forms of cognitive dissonance. And these are insufficient justification, effort justification, and post-decision justification. And it's going to be important for you to recognize different types of situations that fall into these three more subtle forms of cognitive dissonance. And in fact, the first uh, these these three forms of uh, cognitive dissonance were one of the first ones explored beyond just basic hypocrisy. So moving on to slide 25, where we unpack in insufficient justification. So one of the most classic studies in social psychology um, was, in fact, conducted by Leon Festinger and his graduate student, who was named Carl Smith. Um, and it was called the Measures of Performance Study. And what they did was they had their uh, participants engage in an incredibly boring task. Like it was... So boring. They brought them in and they said, we'd like you to organize these spools, these spools of, of, of varying heights and color. We want you to organize these little spools um, and, 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 and go do that. And they piloted this 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 task, meaning they did it, gave it to a bunch of people and then asked them, how 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 fun is it? And these people said it's super freaking boring. So the first 50 people, they just they just established that this was an incredibly boring task. Right. First 50 people came in. They engaged in this incredibly boring task um, and they asked them, hey, how interesting was it? And unsurprisingly, all 50 people said so boring. I wanted to like fall asleep right here. So then they recruited a bunch of other people who they didn't ask right away how interesting was this task. But they knew, based on these other folks, that it was pretty darn boring. So they recruit this, this, this next hundred people, and all of these people were men. Because this was the 50s, and so much of the research was conducted just on men. They recruited these hundred men, and they had them do this task. And everyone did it, right? Everyone did the task, because these were research participants, and they did as they were told. And then everyone was asked at this point, all 100 men, to tell the next participant, who was a fake participant, ooh, a fake participant, they were all told to tell the next participant, who was a fake female participant, how task how how enjoyable the fun, the task was how fun it was they told ever they told these 100 men hey can you please tell this next participant who happens to be a pretty girl will you please tell her that this uh, spool organizing task is super fun right now we know as the researchers that this is a boring task 
But we haven't asked these dudes what they think of the task yet. And then we ask them to tell the pretty girl that it's a fun ta a task. Please tell her that it's a fun task. Now here's where things get interesting. Because then they do a true experiment. They split up these group of men into two groups. And at this point, they give one half of the men a large sum of money for telling the next participant the task was fun, like 20 bucks. Then they give the other group of men only a dollar, right? A small sum of money for their troubles. Here's a dollar for telling the next participant it was fun. So that was their independent variable. Then their dependent variable was it was only at this point, it was only at this point that they then asked their participants how fun was the task. Now that you've done it, now that you've told the pretty girl that the task is fun, and now we've either given you a dollar, one half of the guys, or twenty dollars, the other half of the guys. And the question then becomes, are these two groups of guys going to evaluate this task differently? Are these two groups of guys, one group given a dollar, the other group given twenty dollars, are these two groups of guys going, is one of these groups going to think the spool organizing activity was more fun than we know it to actually be? So what do you think happened? Who thinks that the people who got $20 are going to think the task is super fun? Who thinks that the guys who only got the dollar are now going to think the task is super fun? Well, if you said $20, you're wrong and you're a behaviorist like B.F. Skinner. If you said $1, you understand cognitive dissonance. Because here's the deal. What they found was that the men who were only given a dollar, only given a dollar to tell the pretty co-ed that, she, that it, the task was fun, were confronted with some pretty hefty cognitive dissonance. They were insufficiently rewarded for their behavior. So they couldn't figure out why they did it. Because they didn't recognize all the social pressure involved. They didn't recognize they did, they, that they did not recognize that they had been manipulated into telling the girl it was fun, right? So imagine their thought processes. I just told the pretty co-ed that, that that task was fun. A co-ed co is an old word for, for, um, for woman, right? I just told the pretty co-ed that the task was fun, right? I told the pretty girl the task was fun, but I wasn't paid very much to do that. I remember doing that task and I just told her that it was fun and I wasn't paid hardly anything to tell her it was fun. Why did I do that? Why, why did I lie to her for no good reason? Why did I tell her that? It's not because I lied. It's because I actually think the task was fun. Ha ha ha. Because it would be inconsistent to think the task was boring and then lie to the pretty co-ed for no good reason. That would be inconsistent. That would cause cognitive dissonance. And so they avoided, they avoided having to feel the cognitive dissonance by changing their thoughts, changing their belief that the task was actually boring, changing their belief to be the task was actually interesting, right? The $1 folks, the $1 folks believed that the task was more fun than it actually was. So that is insufficient reward, insufficient reward when you can't think of a good reason why you did something. So you start believing that the activity itself is intrinsically awesome, right? Like, uh, uh, Right. So just think you can think of other real world examples of why this might happen. Right. Where you're you're doing something and you don't get rewarded for it. And you're like, why did I do it? Oh, that's because doing it was was, in fact, the right thing to do. Right. Whether it was or not. The second type of cognitive distance I want to go over is called effort justification. 
And this is essentially the idea that once you've put a lot of effort into something, once you've put a great deal of effort into something, you don't want to believe that that effort is wasted. And if you start to believe that the effort is wasted, when the two, the two inconsistent elements would be, I put a lot of effort in and that effort was for nothing. This reminds you of your Mary and Keach, right? They put a lot of effort into getting ready for the aliens and that effort turned out to be for no good reason, right? Similar to that right then we start to feel cognitive dissonance we don't want to believe that our efforts were in vain that's inconsistent with our behavior the fact that we put a lot of effort out right so we'll engage in mental backflips to justify our effort um so here's a good example of this classic research aronson and mills 1963 um elliot aronson was a student of leon festinger's and uh, he currently is a professor at uc santa cruz and he writes textbooks he uh, it's one of the main things that he does he writes a social psychology textbook and a, a textbook about persuasion and a bunch of other textbooks right so here we have um uh effort justification processes and here's what they did in this study. They had a bunch of women who research on women now. That's awesome. And they, they put signs up all over campus that said we would like women to volunteer to be a part of a dynamics of uh, group discussion or we're going to talk about the psychology of sex. And so the women volunteered. So these were women who were interested in 1963 to talk about sex in sort of a safe environment. And so what they did is then all these women were brought in and they were interviewed. And this and it was in fact a true experiment. They split up these women into three groups. The first group didn't have to do anything in order to join um, the the discussion group about sex, right? This was a control group. They, they were just like, oh, okay, you want to join the group? No problem. You're, you're in. The second group of women, however, had to read aloud sex-related words that were obscene. So like vulva, they were so uh, or uh, sex-related words that were not necessarily, you know, graphic sexually. Things like vulva or nipple, right? Sex words, but not, not you, know, you know, sexual intercourse related. And then the third group of women was called the severe group, and they had to read aloud from a very uh, sexually explicit, lurid, would have been at the time considered very obscene and pornographic a novel, and they had to read aloud to a male researcher. And again, these were all women. And so now we have these three groups of women. The first group had to put no effort into joining the group. The second group had to put a little bit of effort into joining the group. And the third group had to put a lot of effort into joining the group. And then they had all of these women listen to the actual tapes from the discussion group they had just joined. And these were the most boring tapes ever. They were on the secondary sex characteristics of birds. So we're talking feathers here. They listened to tapes about feathers. Feathers. Now, the dependent variable comes in. They ask these women to rate how interesting these tapes on bird sex were. How interesting were these tapes about feathers? What do you think happened? Do you think that there was a difference between these three groups? Right? And there, in fact, there was. It was the group that had to do the most effort, the group that had to read aloud from a pornographic novel that said that these tapes were super interesting. Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure, uh, absolutely. I, I think bird sex is fascinating. I think plumage and feather displays are super fascinating. Where the group that didn't have to work at all to join the group were like, that's the most boring group I've ever heard of ever. I do not want to join that group. So what does this suggest? This suggests that these women were experiencing cognitive dissonance, that they were willing to change their beliefs about how interesting the, this discussion was in order to have their worlds make sense, in order for them to have put forth effort for good reason, effort justification. And moving on to slide 28, there's actually a famous quote that gets at this. It's by Thomas Paine, from, is a founding father. What we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly, right? We work hard for things, and so we value them. And 
it cre- and, and that's okay, right? That's not cognitive dissonance, the fact that we work really hard for things and when we work really hard, we value them. What can create dissonance for us is when we throw and can sometimes allow us to throw what's called good money after bad, what, what can cause some irrational behavior is we think to ourselves, I've already put so much effort in, I don't wanna believe that that effort was in vain. And so we keep going down a terrible path because we don't want to believe that our efforts are not justified. And part of why this and part of what this process is effort justification. We have two consistent elements. I put forth a lot of effort, I put forth a lot of effort for no good reason. That creates dissonance. That creates dissonance. A lot of effort for no good reason. And so then we change that belief. We change the belief that our efforts were for no good reason. We convince ourselves that our efforts were meaningful. We convince ourselves that our, that, that, that our effort was, in fact, for a good cause. And I think another, a couple of real good examples of this are things like fraternities and sororities, where they make you haze in order to join, right? According to behaviorism, if I try to join a group and they torture me, I'm going to think it's the worst group ever. Ah, B.F. Skinner would say, if someone tortures you to join a club, you are totally not going to want to hang out with those people again. But according to cognitive dissonance, if you put forth a great deal of effort to join something, you're going to value it. You're going to value that group, and even if you start to question the value of that group, you're going to engage in a mental backflips, rationalizations, to convince yourself the group is awesome which is one of the reasons why people start to identify so strongly with their fraternities and sororities. There is, a, there is an effect to that hazing. Um, it sort of uh, irrationally convinces you of the awesomeness of the group, even if that group isn't, in fact, so awesome. The last type of cognitive dissonance that's more subtle I want to go over is called post-decision justification. And this is, this is the kind of cognitive dissonance that can happen if you have buyer's remorse, post-decision justification. It's the idea that after you make a decision that you can't take back, if anything makes you question that decision, that is going to cause cognitive dissonance. I've made a decision I can't take back. I'm starting to question my decision. Cognitive dissonance. Now I'm going to start engaging in mental backflips to convince myself that my decision was a good one. So here's the, the, a study that demonstrated it from 1956. Now again, I'm sharing, you the cl- sharing with you the classic studies, for the very first demonstrations of this, but they've been studying this ever since. And cognitive dissonance, totally a thing. Dozens and dozens of studies that demonstrate people engage in these sorts of behaviors and these sorts of rationalizations and these mental backflips. So this study from 1956 was called the Consumer Goods Study, where women rated household products, right? And so the researchers were able to get how women actually evaluated a number of household products, right? And then they were allowed to take home one of the household household products. And here's where things got interesting. Here's where things became a true experiment. In one condition, in one particular group, the women were given no choice. They were just handed a toaster. In the second group of women, they were given a really easy choice. They were presented with their top 10 choice versus their one choice. So let's say I rated the toaster oven a 1 and I rated the clock radio a 10. I'm going to pick the clock radio if you give me a choice between those two things, right? An easy choice. And then lastly, there was a group of women who was given a choice between two things that they rated relatively equally, right? Um, Like, let's say the the waffle iron, I rated it a five, and the coffee maker, I rated it a five. Do I choose the waffle maker or or the, the, the waffle iron or the coffee maker? Waffle iron or the coffee maker? I don't know what to choose. So it's a very tough choice. Right? A tough choice where you might start to question your decision. And so then the dependent variable was a week later, they came back and um, a week later they came back and they asked the women to reevaluate the products. So what happened? What happened uh, on slide 30 is that the women who had had to make a hard choice, a choice they couldn't take back, rated whatever thing they chose higher 
It's called the spreading of alternatives. But this only happened in the hard condition. If you didn't give if you didn't give a woman a choice, if you just handed her the clock radio, she's like, thanks for the clock radio. And let's say she rates it a four. Next week, how, how do you think about the clock radio? Well, I rated it a four. Remember when I rated it a four? Women who were given the easy choice also did not change their ratings, right? They were given a choice between the one the 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 the, the the one item they rated a 1 and the other one item they rated a 10 and they said, how did you feel about your choice? And they're like, it's still awesome. Thought it was awesome last week. Still think it's awesome this week. Still a 10. Thanks. But women in the third group who were given, were given a choice between two fives, two things they rated equally but not super strong, these women went home and started to doubt their choice. They were like, oh, I chose the coffee maker. I chose the coffee maker, but mm, that waffle iron was so awesome also. And, oh, I'm not sure if I made the right choice. Then you start to rationalize. No, I chose the coffee maker. In fact, the coffee maker was better all along. Now that five coffee maker is a seven or an eight. And think about all the times in life where this might happen to you. So let's say you're choosing a college, right? And you've got a choice between three colleges. Because you get into CSUN, uh, Cal State LA, and uh, you know Cal State uh, Dominguez Hills, whatever it is, right? And you're not sure where to go. You rate them. You rate them all fairly equally. You don't have. You, you, they're all good schools. Um, and so you decide to choose one. Maybe then you. So you hear something about how the current school you're at is maybe doesn't have as good a sports team or maybe doesn't have small class sizes and you start to going, oh no, I may have made the wrong decision. Now you start engaging in mental backflips. Now you start saying to yourself, no, no, no. I chose CSUN because CSUN is actually awesome. It's closer to my house. It is closer to my house. I don't know, it has great teachers, it's got good food options, right? You start coming up with all the different reasons why the choice you did make was the right choice. Post-decision justification. And it happens when it's a tough choice. It happens with a tough choice that you can't take back. Here's a more modern example of this in slide 31. They did the exact same type of study, but with modern day individuals, and they did it with two different hybrid cars. They had groups of people who were considering buying the Prius and considering buying the Civic Hybrid. And at the beginning, everyone uh, rated them uh, the same. You know, some people rate, you know, on average, people rated the Prius and the hybrid as relatively high, seven, almost, you know, 7.75 versus 7.725 on a, on a scale of 1 to 10. And then they checked back in uh, 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 a couple months later with the people who had per actually purchased the Prius. And they found the people who had purchased the Prius, suddenly that Prius was way more awesome. And not only that, but they actually evaluated the Civic as less awesome. Even though, now you could argue that, well, rating the Prius higher is just because now they're driving around in it, right? They Now they know how awesome it is. But that doesn't explain why they would rate the Civic lower. They haven't been driving around in the Civic learning what a lemon it is. This is cognitive dissonance. You say, my choice was actually awesome and that other choice, it sucked. Post-decision justification. So, the last thing I want to go over when we talk about cognitive dissonance is how do people get rid of it? And we've talked about uh, some some examples from the research, right? But I want to cover uh, where we can sort of change our beliefs. But I want to unpack this a little more. I want to go over all the different ways that people can, can get rid of their cognitive dissonance, right? I want to sort of explore all of those processes. And that's called dissonance reduction. How do people get rid of this yucky state we call cognitive dissonance? And there's a variety of different tactics that people can use. Some of them better grounded in critical thinking than others, right? And our knee-jerk reactions are often to engage in inappropriate, irrational mental backflips that we call rationalizations. But there's, but there, but there's a wide variety of strategies that we can use. And here are the broad categories of the different ways you can get rid of cognitive dissonance, right? You can change your beliefs. Belief A, you can change belief B or change your behavior if that's what's inconsistent. 
or you can sort of add rationalizations, add excuses, add new thoughts, add, uh, sort of drown out. You can sort of uh, drown out uh, all the various, uh, you can sort of drown out all of the, the dissonance inducing thoughts, right? All right, so let's use a working example. Noah and his friends have been in a party. Although Noah agreed to be the designated driver, he drank too much beer, and now he is drunk. Still, he gets behind the wheel with three other friends, starts the car. No one knows that drunk driving kills, yet he drives off anyway. So now, we have cognitive dissonance. I'm a person who does not agree with driving drunk, is dissonant with, I'm a person who is drunk driving. These two thoughts... If Noah thinks about them at the same time, or if someone points them out to him, is going to create some dissonance. Dissonance. Slide 35. So, what can Noah do to get rid of his dissonance? Noah can change his beliefs. There are two beliefs here. Let's say he chooses to change the belief that he doesn't agree with drunk driving. In the moment, he can start convincing himself that drunk driving is fine, right? Well, I know I normally would say drunk driving isn't cool, and I, uh, but maybe now, maybe, 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 maybe drunk driving isn't that big a deal. And so the fact that I'm driving drunk is also not that big a deal, right? Right. Most drunk drivers get to, get there safely. It's not that big a deal, and and you know most people are not killed in accidents. It's really not that big a deal, right? Or he could change the other thought. I'm not actually driving drunk. Yes, it's wrong to drive, br drive drunk, but I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm not really drunk. I've only had five beers. I'm good. Right? He just can convince himself that he's not actually drunk. Either one of these would be the same kind of example, right? Noah can change his cognitions. Noah can change his thoughts so that he no longer has to experience dissonance right? You can change I'm drunk to I'm not really drunk. Slide 37, right? I'm not really drunk. Or you could change the belief that drunk driving is wrong. Either, either way, you're changing your consciousness, right? Forgetting is often a thing to do as well. We call this denial, right? Get with people who engage in denial. So for example, and this is very common when you're drunk, right? Uh, if you're, if, so you may believe, you may believe that you're driving drunk, but when you're drunk, you sort of forget that it's wrong. Maybe you just forget or deny that it's wrong or, or just don't think about it. Just don't think about it. Just don't think that it's wrong to drive drunk. And in fact, if someone points out to you, Hey, it's not cool that you're about to drive drunk. That may make you pretty angry because you are doing a pretty good job of forgetting that. And now you have to experience cognitive dissonance. Now you feel like a hypocrite and that makes you mad, right? That's another thing that can reduce dissonance. Simply willfully denying or not thinking about one of the inconsistent thoughts. Or, slide 39, Noah can start adding new thoughts. He can start making excuses for himself to drown out the dissonance. Saying things to himself like, well, I know it's wrong to drive drunk, and I know I'm drunk, but I'm special. I'm an especially good driver. I'm so awesome that even when I've been drinking, I'm like Mario and Freddy. I am Vin Diesel in Fast and the Furious. I am so awesome. Do you hear the excuses that Noah is making for himself? Or you might make the excuse, I'm the only one who could drive. Sure, it's wrong to drive drunk, and sure, I'm drunk, but I'm the only one who, who could drive here, and right? Or he could say, you know, I know it's wrong to drive drunk, and I know that I'm drunk, but I'm a risk taker. This is a good day to die. I'm going to live fast, die young, and leave a good-looking corpse, right? Just start making excuses. Add new thoughts. And on slide 40, this is what it sort of looks like. It's not that you change your thoughts. You just make excuses stack on top of it so you don't have to think about the fact that you're being inconsistent. You don't have to think about it. And so you don't have to think about, you don't have to feel the cognitive dissonance. You're drowning it out. Or Noah could change his behavior, right? Noah could decide to pull over, call an Uber, call a Lyft, and not drive drunk. He could do that. 
And that would, in fact, slide 42, reduce his distance as well. However, however, slide 43. People are motivated to do the path, what's called the path of least resistance, right? People tend to want to do something that's efficient, right? People tend to only exert a great deal of effort when they're highly motivated. And so unless Noah is highly motivated to change his behavior, he will often take the path of least resistance. He'll, in fact, take the easiest route. And oftentimes the easiest route is to simply change what you believe. Simply change your beliefs to be consistent with your behavior. Hey, it's easier than changing your behavior, right? And so that's often what happens to people in these dissonant situations. Instead of going, hey, 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 you pointed out I'm a hypocrite. I need to change my behavior. They argue with you about whether or not they're really doing the thing you say you're doing. Or they argue with you about what, so let's take the drunk driving example. You see a friend who's been drinking. You say, hey, it's wrong to drive drunk. And they're like, I'm not drunk. Then they're like, oh, you're right. Because they, because there's more effort. There's more effort into calling an Uber. There's more effort into calling a Lyft. More effort into saying, well, I guess I should just stay at the party for a while or even sleep it off here. There's more effort involved in that than just convincing yourself you're not drunk. And people tend to be what are called motivated reasoners. We like to solve our problems with, in the most efficient way possible unless we're highly motivated to, um, to make a good decision, which is what I want you to do. You're a good critical thinker now, right? And so when you're in these situations and you find yourself engaged in these mental backflips, these rationalizations, ask yourself, am I, am I trying to reduce cognitive dissonance here? Am I trying to convince myself that, that my way of thinking about things is still the right way because I don't want to admit that I've been wrong? Am I trying to convince myself that I have not done something because I don't want to face my own hypocrisy? Am I convincing myself of some very irrational things to not have to deal with cognitive dissonance, right? Examine yourself and try to check yourself to make sure you are not a victim of your own cognitive dissonance. All right, so I will see you next time where we'll talk about conformity and how conformity can um, can impact uh, can impact uh, our ability to make good decisions. Um, and it, all right. See you next time.